So I'm going to talk about four projects today. Uh, the first has to do with uh, the use of natural language processing to digitally scaffold reading. Uh, about 20 to 30, in the last 20 to 30 years, pretty much all professional and academic writing moved from paper to the screen. And I, I'd say probably very few of us do serious writing uh, on paper at this point. And we're, it's a little bit s slower, but we're going through a similar transition in the area of reading, with reading generally you know, starting to migrate from, from paper to the screen. And that creates a lot of uh, possibilities of uh, new forms of scaffolding and supporting reading. So uh, this intervention is based on the fact that the uh, human eye span can really only take in about 10 characters at a time, excuse me. So when you actually see a passage like this, uh, you're really only taking in about 10 or 15 characters at a time, and your, your eye is kind of jumping back and forth. And uh, that gets very confusing, especially for uh, weak readers or readers with uh, weak knowledge of, of English syntax. And that's why uh, reading something in a format like this is a lot more difficult than reading something in a format like this because you have to do you know, less of that eye movement. But, uh, and when you do read, these eye movements back and forth are called regressions because you often get lost and you go back and forth. And these uh, uh, regressions don't occur arbitrarily, but they typically uh, occur at phrase boundaries or syntactic boundaries. Uh, you know, I uh, threw him the ball and Stephen. Did I throw him the ball and Stephen, or did I throw him the ball and then Stephen is going to do something else? And you're looking back and forth. So when I'm speaking to you, I have all sorts of cues that I use to signal the syntactic boundaries, so which I'm doing right now through my voice and my hands. Uh, but in reading, uh, those things aren't there. Now. There are ways to, to signal those syntactic boundaries. So uh, does anybody recognize what this is? It's a poem, but it didn't uh, originally appear in this format. It appeared in this format. And uh, this might be a little bit more familiar. Does anybody know what that is? OK, it's a short computer program. It's code. But we don't, we don't usually write it like that. We write it like this. So you can actually see the syntax. I mean, if you saw things like that, it would be a lot harder to process than like this. Well, somebody get the idea. What if we did that for reading? So instead of taking things like this, we could take them like that. And we could even colorize kind of the main verb so things would stand out more. And so they developed a, uh, they developed a, uh, spent years and years uh, developing a program, uh, which they call Live Inc., which uh, takes texts and uses natural language processing to convert them uh, automatically on the fly. So they have it, and uh, it's the, uh, the line breaks uh, are at the phrase and clause boundaries. The shorter rows of texts are supposed to match to, so you only have one or two fixations per text. And there's a cascade that sort of shows the syntactic hierarchy. The theory is that this matches more closely to the way the eyes and the mind take in information. So this, uh, the company that developed this is Live Inc. And this formatting is called uh, Visual Syntactic Text Formatting. So they and we have done a number of studies over the years uh, excuse me, to investigate uh, what happens when people read in visual syntactic text formatting, or VSTF. So just to show you a little bit more how it works, uh, this is like a New York Times uh, page. You can take any digital text and you kind of highlight it and plug it in, and then it will on the fly uh, reformat it in this way and then you can scroll down uh, one paragraph per paragraph. They make the paragraphs different colors so you can kind of see the distinction between them. 
Uh, they've also done some things to simplify it further. They've taken some digital textbooks and pre-formatted the entire books in this way. And then a student can either you know, read them in the regular format or they can click on the feather up there and then it will pop up in, in visual syntactic text formatting. So uh, some of the studies have been done. Uh, they've done studies with college students uh, reading, uh, reading uh, science texts and giving them basic in either traditional block formatting or VSTF and giving them comprehension tests afterwards and found uh, that there have been uh, larger than small, medium size improvements in comprehension. Uh, students understand when they take quizzes afterwards, they've comprehended more. Uh, they've also done eye tra tests with eye tracking. So they look at how much you know, time it takes and how the eye moves across the page. And they found that people uh, read faster in VSTF, uh, not because they spend any more or less time on each word, but because they have fewer regressions back and forth. Uh, and we did uh, studies in school districts. In school districts, people are especially concerned about students' test scores. So we had students uh, read for an entire year about an hour a week in VSTF. We took their uh, English and social studies books, these were sixth grade students, and converted them to uh, VSTF format. So it, it wasn't, it, this was a little bit different study because in the prior studies on comprehension, all the reading was being done on computer, either in block formatting or VSTF. In this study, Half the kids were doing their normal reading in the textbooks and the other half. They all had computers all the time in their classes, but they were using the textbooks for reading. The other half uh, were using uh, reading about an hour a week in VSTF. And in several components of the California Standards Test, English Language Arts Test, uh, word analysis, written conventions, and written strategies uh, students' scores increased more over the year uh, after having read VSTF. And I think the theory behind that is they just engaged more with the text, they understood the structure more of the text, they could see how the structure was put together. Uh, the the uh, researchers suggested that students would also improve in reading comprehension after a year of using this. Uh, we didn't find any positive or negative effect on that. Uh, I think uh, that's kind of an overview of uh, visual syntactic text formatting and uh, some of the studies we've done on that and we now have a large uh, grant proposal and then to do a much larger study uh, where all the reading will be done on either uh, half the schools will have Chromebooks, half the schools will have iPads and all the material will be converted either to block format or VSTF format and we'll look at the impacts. So I'll go on to the other studies, but I just thought I'd see if uh, any discussion, questions, comments. Yes? So you mentioned there's a lot less eye movement. Is that um, like a mistake that a person makes while comprehending it and then has to go back? Do they, do well, they it's, it's, it's not so much a mistake, but it's kind of a natural thing. When you read, when you read through, you know, your eye, all what you read about, 10 or 15 characters at a time, and then you jump, and you jump, and you jump. And everybody, I mean, nobody reads perfectly linearly through. Everybody kind of jumps back and forth. So it's not really a mistake. It is true that if you're uh, more fluent in English, uh, more knowledge of the subject area, uh, a better reader, you'll probably go back and forth less. Does, does that mean, I mean, I know that making mistakes is like, just basically the way that I learn if it is, does that, if someone were completely raised on this and then had to read normal text, would they just be? Well, we found in our study, uh, students read, now we haven't done any studies where students read this all week, and nobody's suggesting that. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who designed this uh, recommend that students read about 45 minutes or an hour a week for that. So in our, in our study, students read about 50 minutes a week from this. and. Uh, 
the, the reading comprehension tests, which were done at the end of the year, which were done on normal block formatting, uh, there, uh, there were no differences between them and uh, people who had read block formatting the entire time. They had, they, had, they had proposed that maybe there would be gains, but there were no gains, there were no losses. Yeah. It seems like it's a really, I would say it's a it's <laughs> By the way, you can go to liveink. forget whether it's liveink.com or liveink.org, just type liveink, and they have this thing, and you can try it out there. They have this uh, program called Web Clip Read, which you can use to just cut and paste your own things. Relevant to what you're saying, we did hear that uh, students engaged more, especially the middle, you know, elementary, middle school students. They have a tendency to just glaze over text. You know, it's kind of pseudo reading. And uh, teachers were saying this: the students were really forced to kind of go through the text. You know, uh, so uh, the and yes, the idea is that, for example. You know, in places like China and Korea and Japan and many countries around the world, you have millions or tens of people who are majoring in STEM fields and science, technology, or engineering, mathematics, who are not English majors. They're not English specialists, but they have to, they do so much of literature in the world, in scientific literature is in English. So they get to college and they're expected to read, you know, chemistry or physics papers in in uh, English. My thought is that something like this would be, would be quite valuable. I mean, I myself have studied a number of languages that I don't, I kind of know, but I don't know that well, and I'm thinking that I would be able to read in, in VSTF better than I would be able to read in this kind of big block. Yes? I find it really surprising that reading comprehension didn't improve. I mean, why do you think that is? Well, I mean, the tests were given in block format. So, you know, that could be, I mean, the reading comprehension was improved when they read in that format. But, I mean, the te when they went back and took the tests in the traditional block format, there wasn't, an, in our studies, there weren't any gains transferred. It might have just been, you know, in previous studies, uh, there were gains. And, uh, you know, they, the, again, the theory behind that is if you have a poor reader, one of the best ways to help uh, a poor young reader read is to uh, learn to read is by uh, reading aloud to them. Because if you have a bad reader, a child, they can maybe understand each word, but they don't really understand how it puts, goes together. So they might be the man threw the ball that was, you know, they kind of read each word, but they don't really understand the structure. So the idea is reading in this way can help them understand the structure, but we hope to do a larger study that might help us. There were, there were problems in, in this study. Uh, because it was a fairly low budget study, uh, we converted all the uh, textual material to VSTF, but we were not able to like include all the graphical material for the textbooks. I mean, you take a social studies text, much of the information conveyed is through graphs, figures, fonts, etc. So it was kind of an imperfect study where we had only the text, but the, the rest of the social studies material wasn't there. They had to kind of go back to their book if they wanted to see that. So we're applying for more funding to do a study where we could really create real e-books that would be identical except for the text formatting. Okay, these two more questions, and then we'll go on. You and then behind you, yeah. Is the STF only for English, or do you have it in other uh, it, it only exists for English. Uh, I mean, there's a lot, so it's not like, you know, language independent. I mean, it's based on natural language processing. A lot of it is not trivial that took them years to develop. I mean, for example, usually you, a preposition starts a prepositional phrase. I put the ball on the table. So you put, I put the ball on the table. But sometimes when you have uh, verb phrases, uh, like, I picked 
up the ball. It's not I picked up the ball, it's I picked up the ball. So they had to do a lot of tweaking for years. They had, I think that there was a guy from uh, IBM, they, somebody from IBM, a big NLP guy, did a lot of it. So in theory, it could exist for other, uh, certainly for, I would think, for most European languages, but I've never heard of anybody developing it. Go ahead. How reliable is the abstract form? But in the context, like if you take a large context and have an abstract form which is bold and like chromatic thing, so how, how close the context of this material? The content is exactly the same. The, the content is exactly the same. It's just you have to scroll through a lot of pages to get there. Okay. But they're, we're not, they're not abstracting it. They're taking the content and, and, and reformatting it. And uh, there's actually, uh, oh, what the heck, I'm going to show this to you. There's another little part that I left out of this, uh, which is kind of really e uh, interesting thing, which I'm going to show you. Uh, let me see here. Try to show you if this opens. Well, let's see, I guess it's not going to open. Okay. Uh, try one other thing here. Uh, hmm? Oh, there it is. Good idea. So it's kind of interesting. One of the things they show is that uh, the way of presenting text has changed a lot over time. So it used to be presented through logographs. Uh, and then when they first started alphabetical languages, uh, there were only consonants. I mean, this is not English, but it's an example. There were only consonants. There were no vowels. There were no punctuations. And it was quite hard to read. And then they added vowels, and that made it a lot easier to read. Uh, and then they started, uh, Aristophanes started putting punctuation in, which made it a little bit easier. And then they, they used lowercase, upper and lowercase, which made it easier too. And then, uh, about 900 AD, they started putting spaces between words. And somebody actually wrote a book about this. It's called Space Between Words, The Origin of Silent Reading. And his point is that just putting space bet spaces between words totally changed the way people read. It was a lot easier to read sight. You know, before that, people kind of had to sound out the words to order to understand what's going on. But with spaces between words, they could read uh, silently. And uh, the, uh, and that, Stu that changed, you know, uh, literacy and learning and research and the development of science. So the point that is made is that from about 900 AD until today, there haven't been that many changes in formatting. And I think that's one of the things that's interesting about this. In digital realms, we can, you know, it would have been very impractical on paper to do VSTF because a, a, a 200 page book would turn into a 2,000 page book. But, you know, there's, I mean, for those of you who are interested in, in theories related to reading, the whole field of reading is changing so much uh, through new kinds of formatting, through glosses, through audio visuals, through ways of discussing reading when you're going on. So, I won't go on and on about that, but that's, you know, kind of one area of research within technology and learning, which I think is quite interesting. Okay, let's go back. Thank you for suggesting I open the PDF. Okay. So I want to go to another study, which is also quite interesting, uh, which is related to automated scoring of essays. 
So, uh, writing is very con con writing is very valuable for learning, and we know that uh, formative feedback is very valuable for learning, and formative feedback is very valuable for learning to write. But it's very uh, whether you have a, a high school teacher who has 150 students, six classes of maybe more than 150, maybe five, six classes of 100 of 30 kids or you've got a college uh, professor who's got large lecture classes, it's very hard to give individual feedback on writing. So people for a long time have been looking at ways to uh, do automated scoring of writing. So uh, this has existed in the last uh, 30, well, almost since the 1960s. And on a number of the uh, graduate exams you might take, like uh, the GMAT I think uses it, I'm not sure if the GRE uses it. Instead of having two human scores, they now have one human score and one machine score. And uh, if the two are identical or within one point of each other, they just leave it. If they are off by two points, then they get a third reader. I don't know, maybe that's a gorilla or something. <laughs> so just to give you an example of the some of the more modern machine learning approaches to, to automated scoring. We're working with, partnering with a couple called, uh, a, a company called Lightside. So here's an example. You got, you've probably heard of the Common Core. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on reading and writing about math in the Common Core. So here's an example. There are 12 boys and 11 girls in Sahil's class. Sahil uses these numbers to say that the ratio of boys to students in his class is 12 to 11. Explain why Sahil is not correct. That's the, the prompt, the question. And a student says, Sahil is not correct because there are 11 girls in his class, not 11 students. Is that answer correct? Yes, it's correct. But it's a little bit, you would think that it would be a little bit hard to score by machine because you might expect to say, you know, the ratio is not 12 to 11, it's 12 to, you know, uh, it's 12 to 23 or something like that, but it doesn't say that. But still, this is how a machine le uh, learning tool would work. This particular one, Lightside, it uh, identifies every single word in the text, and it identifies every uh, verb, every uh, syntactic phrase in the text. I'm sorry, every, com every collocation of words. Every syntactic phrase, like a noun phrase or preposition phrase or whatever, and every piece of every word. Now this last one puzzled me. Why do they need every piece of every word? They need that because uh, K to 12 students often misspell words. So it's kind of like they can get partial credit, you know, if they partially spell the word correctly. So they, they have tens and thousands, from a single sentence, they have hundreds or thousands of elements. And what they do is they compare, all of these systems start with a certain number of, of essays, usually like maybe about 400, which have been scored by hand. So they give this essay, this, this is not even an essay, it's a one sentence reply. They give it to, uh, they give several hundred exemplars to teachers. And in this case, in an essay, it might be a score of four, three, two, one on different dimensions. And this one is probably just correct or incorrect. Well then, what they do, after taking all these elements, they take all these countable elements and they use machine learning to compare them to previously scored uh, essays, essays that were previously scored, answers or essays that were previously scored uh, by hand. So, for example, so in this case it was just, you know, it was, it was uh, bimodal. It either got a zero or a one for your answer. And it's, they can look to see which, in this case, the vocabulary, which vocabulary words tended to correlate more with zeros or more with ones. So if it had the word, you know, class in it, it very highly correlated with the correct answer. If it had the word his in it, it correlated with an incorrect answer. Now all of these seem arbitrary, and none of them by themselves determines. But when you take hundreds or thousands of elements like these, and you add them all up, you can say, 
this looks like a one or this looks like a zero. And you can do that about as accurately as human scores can do. So, uh, wait, let's, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. Uh, so here, so for example, uh, Sahil's ratio, this shows how many training sets you need to be as le at least as reliable as a human score. Now what that means is you have several human scores score a question. And then it's scored again either by a machine or a human being. You know, which is closer to the median of the previous human scores? The software or another human score? So for the one we just looked at, Sahil's ratios, after you have a training set of about 200, after you've given, you have, if you have 200 human scored essays to start with, the machine is actually, does a better job than human beings in scoring. By better, it means more similar to previous human scores. On a math word problem, it looks like it takes, you know, again, about 250. Uh, some problems are hard. A personal, uh, well, a personal reaction essay is fairly, takes like several hundred. Uh, a world history essay, which is very content laden, you know, gets, gets close to, to human scoring, but actually takes thousands of exemplars to reach human scoring. But on, on almost anything, if you have enough examples, you can get close to or go over the reliability of human scoring. So as I said, these systems are already used in things like the uh, GMAT and a lot of standardized tests. Oh, here's another example of a, of a small study that was done at a, a medical university where uh, students had to do this online quiz uh, as part of an online course they took. And it was, previously it wasn't graded. And uh, they used light, they took several hundred exemplars, machine scores, students' responses, uh, to give them a score on a, just a simple three point, like green light, good, yellow light, so-so, red light, bad. And uh, the, the uh, number of low quality responses jumped substantially uh, over a, a couple month period when they started using this system. Uh, we are uh, starting to use it in a classroom and we're especially interested in one of the differences of LightSide to some of the previous software that has done these things, it can identify the portions of the essay. So if you're doing this on a whole essay, it can identify the portions of the essay that contribute to a high score or a low score. So usually the way this works, maybe you can see this better. Uh, you might have a four-point rubric on clarity, evidence, analysis, and genre. So how clear is this? Uh, how well do you use uh, evidence to make your point? Uh, how systematic is your analysis? How well do you match like the genre that this is supposed to be written in? And you have the, the, the pre-scored essays that are scored by teachers uh, have scored, let's say, 200 or 300 or 400 essays on these four points on the same prompt. Then you feed these in and it gives, oh, this is kind of a nice thing that's done by this light side. Instead of giving numbers, they give signal strengths. <laughs> they, because a number is seen as kind of too final and too judgmental, and students are, are used to seeing signal strengths and wanting to improve their signal strength. So it's the idea that, okay, your signal strength and clarity isn't strong enough, so you need to make it more clear. The idea behind these is that students will revise their papers more. They'll see that you know they got a low score on this or a low score on this, they'll revise. But what we're working with um, them is trying to improve these. This scoring has gone on for a while, but now we want to actually give feedback on the writing. So they can say, you know, these are the these are the passages uh, which were not very clear. Uh, can you compare that to some of your other writing and, and see that you did better? Or these are the particular passages where you didn't tie evidence to claims very well. Can you see if that can be improved? So we have some more grant proposals to uh, do research in this area. We have done some studies in the, uh, previously uh, on uh, school districts that have used automated scoring. 
And our main conclusion to those, uh, I think actually it was done by one of my PhD students in computer science. Uh, I have an appointment in ICS, so I was able to supervise him. And uh, the main conclusion was what we called utility of a fallible tool. The scoring isn't perfect, but it's good enough to get the students revising their work and that in itself and getting more feedback on it. And that in itself is really helpful because the teachers are getting, they have kind of like an assistant, you know, and they can concentrate on small groups while the other students are getting, uh, submitting their work, revising it. Or maybe the teacher, uh, the teacher still corrects the papers, but maybe not the first draft and the final draft, maybe only the final draft. Or maybe not every paper, but maybe every other paper, things like that. Discussion, questions? Yes? Um, I know there are a number of instructors that use something like a calibrated peer review, where it's kind of that process where not only do students review each other's work, but there is kind of that instructor expert peer review that goes on top of that. Could you plug something like this into that as well, so that then you can not only grade the students' work, but you could grade the review of the students' work as well? I'm sure in theory you could. Nobody's done it, but I think this, you know, in the whole, I mean, one of the places this comes into play is in MOOCs, where you have thousands of students, and obviously the instructors can't correct all their, uh, and these are two of the things that are being played around with a lot. One is automated scoring, and one is peer review scoring. And I think some way of getting these two systems to work together, that would be a great research agenda for two or three PhDs. <laughs> to see you know, how they play together and how they can amp be you know, amplified. And... Yes? Um, this might be a really dumb question, but um, the results that come out of this and essays, are they, are they better or are they just more like, do they look more like a template, I guess? Well, that's, that's one of the criticisms, and especially one of the criticisms, you know, I didn't go through the whole history of this, but the software has developed over time. And previous versions of the software did not use this kind of bottom-up machine learning technique, which looks at thousands of factors. They tended to like look at 10, 20, 30, 40 factors, like you know the length of the word and, and certain grammar and certain expressions and this and that. And those systems were pretty easy to manipulate. You know, you would like I, I can remember some times where a student would like add a word and it was actually incorrect but it raised their score, and then they wouldn't want to take it away. So that was one of the criticisms of, of earlier versions of these. They were, they were somewhat could be gained. Light side, I mean, we haven't tested it yet in schools, but, but from playing around with it and seeing how it works and understanding the algorithms, it seems to very, very closely mimic human scoring. So, you know, now if, if, if schools are evaluating template type writing, you know, it will evaluate template type writing. Uh, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's not gonna, you know, it could be superior in terms of humans, in terms of its reliability, but it's not superior in terms of, you know, in any other sense than that. So uh, it, can't, it can't outperform human writing, human, human feedback. You know, at close, it, and it, of course, it can't even match like the value of a one-to-one -one conversation, not by far. Uh, but it does, in terms of the scoring aspect, it it should mimic human scoring. Now, one of the things we want to play around with, what we wrote into our grant proposal, is really trying to get dialogue with students. So we're going to play around with things rather than telling them, you know, this is unclear, fix it. It's like, oh, compare this to this, or. Uh, we also want to start like some mini automated conversations like, uh, you know, what do you think of this? How can you change it? Da, 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 da. So we want to try to make it more reflective to emphasize more critical and reflective and not like just fixing the template. Okay, I'll go on. Uh, so, uh, We've done some research in schools where all the kids write in Google Docs, and uh, you know, just done surveys of kids. Uh, what they do, they tend to write and revise, and uh, in general, students like writing with Google Docs, uh, even compared to writing with uh, 
word processors like Microsoft Office. But one of the, I think the new and innovative part of our research, and this was exciting to me, when students write in Google Docs, all their work is available online. So a couple of years ago, we got the idea, great, let's, let's study it. And to our dismay, and I thought, oh, we'd just go into Google Docs and like press a few buttons and we would analyze these thousands of writing. Well, unfortunately, that didn't exist. So we partnered with uh, Professor Judy Olson here and uh, ICS and some great undergraduates uh, to develop a software program called Scapes. Uh, we had four undergraduates working on it. They did it as part of their service learning course and then an independent study. Uh, one is now working at Google, one is now working at Microsoft, one is now working at Apple, and one is now working at Sony. So we had a great team of undergraduates, and actually the lead person is now working on Google, but not in anything related to this. And what Scapes does is, you know, you give it permission to access Google Docs, and then it, it makes a, uh, you know, collects like all your folders and documents, and it, it basically analyzes them, and it's a pretty crude analysis. What it does is it looks at, you know, uh, the timestamps, uh, who was in the doc. This is, this is all the revisions uh, of a document. And by revisions, I don't, there's two, there's two levels of revision in Google Docs. There's the character by character revision, and then there's the more gross revision, which I don't know how often it does. But, uh, you know, uh, how many, what, what the word count was, how many words were added, how many words were uh, deleted, and, you know, who the authors were. Well, that's, that's pretty simplistic stuff, but what it does is it allows us to do sort of, you know, quantitative analysis on a large scale uh, of writing. So, uh, you know, in this school district we were working in, we could see that the average number of authors was 1.34, the average number of edits was, uh, was 4.93, the average document was 15, they worked on a document for 15 days, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, how many people contributed to, you know, most were written by one, but a lot were written by two or three. Uh, how many words were added by the main author, the teacher, or other students. Uh, interestingly, uh, papers that had more than one author uh, started off slowly, but ended up having more words at the end. And uh, I don't really show it here, but the analysis we're working on right now is to look at, for individual students, the relationship of how much they write and revise and collaborate to changes in their attitude towards writing and changes in their test scores on writing. Because we have the pre-tests from last year, or the beginning of the year, we have the post-tests from the end of the year, we've got surveys, pre and post surveys that look at their attitude towards writing in school, and so we can take large numbers of students and look at you know, basic patterns of writing and their relationship to learning to write. I've talked, go ahead. So this is also used as a tool to uh, understand how students engage in like modern day composing of like documents and to encourage uh, better use of it. Yeah. I mean, what we would like to eventually develop is also teacher dashboards. So teachers can see, you know, how much their students write and revise. And then we could combine this with other free and open source tools for vocabulary analysis or syntactic analysis. So teachers can see, you know, how the vocabulary level of their students changes in their writing over time, how the syntactic level changes over time. I'm sure, you know, I mean, we're, I feel like we're in the infancy of all this stuff, but I'm sure in the next 10, 20, 30 years there'll be a lot of developments. I've talked a lot, uh, so I'm going to jump quickly into the last one, which is very short, and then we can just take a few minutes for a more general discussion. Uh, so this is in partnership with a, a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon, Carolyn Rosé who's an expert in the role of discussion in learning and on computer-mediated collaborative learning and automated agents in discussion. So it's based on the concept of academically productive talk that 
you know, you, you don't, you, you can put students in groups to talk about things, but the real learning comes is not just by talking, but when you really push them to deepen their thinking, to explain their thinking, to summarize their thinking, to compare their thinking, to ask things like, you know, uh, whether somebody agrees or disagrees with somebody says and why, or, you know, to, uh, to explain further what they mean, or you seem to have two different ideas, can you explain that? And the challenge is that it's really hard to do that in, in, a, in a classroom discussion, because if you have a whole class discussion, you know, really only a couple people are talking at a time. But if you put it, them in small group discussions, uh, yes, once you train the students to really talk this way, I mean, they can do it themselves, but mostly they're just going to chat. You know, they're not going to really push deeper without the intervention of a, of a mentor or teacher or an agent. So the idea behind that is to develop uh, computer-mediated uh, agents, which, uh, for example, uh, three of the agents they've developed, one is called revoicing, where at cert it, uh, these agents monitor the discussion automatically and at certain key points ask them to revoice, like, uh, you know, could you, uh, could you say that again or could you summarize that or could you explain that more? Uh, one is agree-disagree, to tell whether they agree or disagree with what somebody else has said. And what is explained what somebody else has said? Oh, so and so just said this. You know, what? Is, can you explain that? What do you think of that? So uh, here's uh, you know an example of uh, you know the revoicing agent. Uh, here's what happened in this setup. Uh, these are these sage is all the automated tutor. Uh, would another way to say that be iodine can be used to detect the presence of starch? It's basically re-expressing it for the student and seeing what the students think about that. So these agents pop up automatically in these uh, automated discussions. So uh, we're working with them to develop a year's worth of online biology materials where students in high school biology will go on they'll see a screen on the left and they'll be asked to explain something about what they see and then these agents will uh, pop in. So like on this genetic one, uh, you know, first the, the students have already done a lesson about genetics and then they see this first screen and, you know, they're asked to explain kind of what parent, there's like the grandparents, they're asked to explain what parentage could have resulted in these children. And then again in the second screen and the third screen. And then while they're discussing these things, these automated agents come in and pop in. This work we haven't really, we're just starting on. We're working on a grant proposal. I haven't worked on it yet. But I just uh, wanted to include it to, I, just, I know uh, this is a group that has very broad interests in information technology. And I thought you would be interested in seeing kind of the broad ways that uh, text mining, natural language processing, uh, automated agents, uh, at computer science, et cetera, could be used in, in literacy and learning instruction. So thank you very much.